It's a um, great pleasure to be asked to take part in the slightly belated centenary uh, celebrations for uh, the Journal of Neurology, Neurosurgery and Psychiatry. And the current editor, Matthew Kiernan, has asked me also to discuss uh, one of the milestones of neurology uh, during that hundred years that I think personally has been one of the most impactful. In fact, the one I've chosen, the efficacy of L-dopa therapy, um, situates roughly in the middle of the journal. So it's about uh, since the start of the journal. So it's um, about 50 years ago, which um, to those of us with a particular interest in Parkinson's disease is in some senses a disappointment because we have not had a second golden moment that can compete with the L-dopa story. Uh, so I'm still prescribing to my patients the drug treatment that I prescribed to them 30 or 40 years ago when I started in clinical practice. Now in 1967, uh, which was the year George Kotsias convinced the world that very high doses of dopa, the amino acid precursor of dopamine, was efficacious in the treatment of Parkinson's disease in his paper uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine. In that same year, uh, Margaret Hearn and Melvin Yar at Columbia University uh, described the natural history of Parkinson's disease uh, in the 20th century. And at that time, and when what my teachers really uh, implied to me when they were teaching about Parkinson's disease, it was considered more or less a death sentence. Um, it was caused by the irreversible degeneration and loss of nerve cells in selected brainstem nuclei and there was no really effective palliative, effective symptomatic treatment, although thalamic surgery was still being used to help tremor and anticholinergic drugs had a mild but modest benefit. But other than that, neurologists had very little to offer in the treatment of Parkinson's. And Hernan Yar's paper um, showed that the mortality ratio of people with Parkinson's disease was three times greater than age-matched controls and that perhaps even more significantly 80% of people with Parkinson's disease were either dead or severely disabled and dependent on others for uh, everyday assistance after nine years of disease. So uh, a, a really um, brutal and unpleasant neurodegenerative disorder. And then, um, as I've already mentioned, uh, L-DOPA arrived in the late 1960s. Um, and the story of um, how it arrived in clinical practice is a fascinating one, which has actually been the subject of one or two uh, movies, but perhaps for the wrong reason. Um, one of the, you can learn many things from the story, including lessons from the natural world, uh, the importance of technological advance in medical discovery, the, the equal importance of hard scientific endeavor and never giving up. And one that I think is particularly relevant for today, the partnerships between scientists clinicians and the pharmaceutical industry. And all of those are encompassed in the L-DOPA story. Now, of course, dopamine has become a shorthand pseudo-scientific journalistic method of adding uh, credence to articles in the newspaper where one wants to talk about sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Um, so that that's, it's the neurotransmitter that's linked to all those things and in which it is sometimes claimed abnormalities occur leading to these certain problems relating to behavior. But um, the history of L-DOPA really goes back at least to the, well, it goes back to the Ayurvedic and the use of the snake root plant uh, in Indian medicine. But 
uh, the more recent scientific um, history begins at the beginning of the 20th century and depended to some degree on uh, Albert Hoffman, the owner of the Roche factories, penchant for Windsor beans. And as a consequence of the fact that the beans were grown uh, in um, the factory fields around, around the factory, in the grounds around the factory, one of his first scientists, Marcus, Marcus Guggenheim, was able to isolate the amino acid dopa from the velvet bean. And then later on, Herman Blaschko, uh, an emigre to Britain working in Os Oxford, began to suggest that dopamine was more than an inert precursor on the biosynthetic pathway to noradrenaline, that it may have functions in its own right. And that was a very important step along with the technological development of brain homogenization in the 1950s. And then Arvid Carlson, who, a Swedish uh, scientist who belatedly got the Nobel Prize in the year 2000 for his work in the 1950s, showed conclusively that the administration of L-dopa to rats could correct depletion of dopamine caused by the snake root alkaloid resipine. So those were the, some of the background uh, scienti scientists involved in the discovery of dopamine first as a transmitter, and then uh, subsequently the development and realization that deficiency of dopamine was very important in the causation of the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. And sometimes forgotten these days is the very important work done in the early 60s, six years before Kotsias's work in Vienna by Ole Hornikiewicz and his clinical colleague, Walter Birkmeier. And it was Hornikiewicz, after he had returned from working in Blaschko's lab in Oxford, um, that first demonstrated conclusively that the corpus striatum of patients with Parkinson's disease was markedly depleted in, uh, in Parkinson's disease. Dopamine was markedly depleted. And I just want to, I hope you can hear this, it's Hornikiewicz describing how he could tell that in Parkinson's disease, the chordate and putamen were depleted of dopamine before he even did colorimetric uh, analysis. In my hands that I say, and I, well, I simply uh, changed it to the human brain. And, um, and already in the first Parkinson brain, I remember that very, very uh, clearly. Uh, when I did the dopamine reaction in the extracts of normal brains <coughs> and the uh, Parkinson brain, um, the normal br brain gave, a, you know, normal basal ganglia gave the nice pink color of uh, dopamine, which I could see before putting into the colorimeter, but the Parkinson brain was not at all pink. So I knew already before measuring, before getting the measurements, I knew already there was a lack of dopamine in the Parkinson brain. And then um, after some disputes with his clinical colleague, uh, Birkmeier, um, which is, is one of the many lessons you can learn from the dopamine story, which led to some delays, eventually um, Hornikiewicz arranged for Birkmeier, his colleague in Vienna, uh, to try low doses of intravenous uh, L-dopa in um, a few patients with Parkinson's disease. Now you will see, I think, a fairly convincing uh, example of the potency of even small doses of L-dopa on this video clip. But what happened in the aftermath of this presentation was that nobody could believe it. Nobody could believe that an incurable degenerative disorder could be cured or at least the symptoms removed uh, by an amino acid injection. And things were made even more complex because the papers were published in obscure Viennese journals, which were not read at least by the Anglo-Saxon scientific community. And also 
Birkmaier's personality. He was a very charismatic um, character uh, with strong motivating skills to his patients. So that many uh, skeptics described uh, what he had called the doper effect as the Birkmaier effect. So I'll now show you the clip. Die Zunahme der Beweglichkeit ließ sich leicht objektivieren, wie wir das schon in einem Film im Oktober 1961 in der Gesellschaft der Ärzte zu Wien zeigen konnten. Sie sehen einen Ausschnitt aus diesem Film, der mit 16 pro Sekunde gedreht wurde und jetzt mit 24 pro Sekunde wiedergegeben wird, daher ein gewisser Zeitraffereffekt. Sie sehen die typische Amimie des Gesichtes, die vorgebeugte, starre Körperhaltung, die Schwierigkeiten beim Umdrehen, das Stoßen der Hände erfolgt langsam, das Gehen erfolgt ohne Mitbewegungen, kleinschrittig, mit vorgebeugter, starrer Körperhaltung. Das Umdrehen langsam, der Versuch zu springen gelingt nicht, das Hochheben der Beine auf die Unterlage gelingt unvollkommen und auf Raten. Sie sehen, dass es unmöglich ist, den Kopf auf die Unterlage zu legen. 30 Minuten nach 50 Milligramm L-Dopa intravenös. Die Patientin steht auf, sie bringt die Beine rasch hinauf, sie liegt mit dem Kopf auf der Unterlage, die Aktivität ist rascher und besser vollziehbar. Die Körperhaltung ist gerade, der Gang erfolgt rascher und vor allem mit Mitbewegungen. Das Umdrehen und Wenden geht, das Springen gelingt sogar auf einem Bein. Die Anämie des Gesichtes ist weg, Lachen, Zungenbewegungen nach allen Richtungen sind frei verfügbar. So that, that, that shows you before and after Eldopa, but nobody believed it and we had to wait until Kotsias's two seminal papers in 67 and this second one in 69. And I show you this just to show you a picture of George Kotsias, uh, but also the quote from this paper, uh, drawing our attention to the fact that it is extremely difficult to predict the response uh, of an individual patient with Parkinson's disease to L-dopa therapy. Uh, or indeed how quickly each symptom will work. And this uh, question which exercised Kotsias in 1967 still exercises modern clinicians today. Now, I started, I was fortunate as a junior doctor to have uh, some of the very first neat L-dopa, Laradopa, to treat patients. And it's very hard when I teach my students to convey to them the awakening miraculous effects that giving L-dopa to severely disabled, previously untreated patients uh, had. So all of those young aspirant neurologists of my generation with an eye to the future were attracted very much to neurochemistry. I suppose neurochemistry was really like molecular biology is today. And uh, after our successes in treating and improving the quality of life and life expectancy in Parkinson's disease, we thought the sky was the limit. And we were very optimistic in the 60s and early 70s that we would crack uh, Alzheimer's disease, which we had very modest um, uh, success with in relation to cholinomatic drugs, motor neuron disease and Huntington's disease. And sadly, uh, that has not transpired. And equally, we haven't really managed to get a treatment that is more effective than L-DOPA, as I mentioned in a minute. And partly that is because of the profound effects L-DOPA has. It's, um, one of the most powerful um, symptomatic treatments uh, that we have in neurology apart from antibiotics and possibly steroids. And I wanted to just show you a clip from my own patients of a patient with. So you can see the 
desperate, disabling, embarrassing tremor of this man. And uh, of course, he has other symptoms of Parkinson's. And this is after just a single uh, dose of 200 milligrams of L-dopa. And you'll see that the disabling tremor has completely disappeared, only to be replaced by some very mild dyskinesias affecting his right hand and right foot. So that's really all I wanted to say about the L-dopa milestone, uh, which I think certainly uh, should be in most people's top 10 uh, milestones in clinical neuroscience over the um, last 100 years, simply because it's made such a huge difference uh, to the quality of life of so many people. Now, Matthew Kiernan has also very kindly asked me to say a few words um, in, um, to commemorate the 100 years of the JNNP. Uh, the JNNP, as most of you will know, is a very British institution, British journal, um, and also perhaps one could say up until relatively recently has been a very much a Queen Square dominated journal. So um, Kinnear Wilson was on the staff in 1920 when he started the journal and a number of distinguished um, neurologists who have been on the staff at Queen Square, including Carl Michael, David Marsden, Martin Rosser have been editors. And many of the other editors, including Matthew have spent time training at Queen Square. Uh, when I started at Queen Square, it was affectionately known as the Green Rag. I think it still is known as the Green Rag by many of us. Um, and although it was considered to be inferior to brain, it was a, a journal that everybody loved. And in many ways, it was much more readable um, than uh, brain, which took a lot of time and a lot of effort to read all the very long papers. So uh, most of my generation held the journal with, with great affection and, and used it to, to learn and also to publish our papers in. So my very first paper that I ever wrote in 1975 with David Perkin and Gerald Stern was uh, submitted to the Green Rag. Um, it was called anterior tibial syndrome following prolonged tetany. And after that, I continued to submit papers to um, JNNP and continue to do so now. And I, I would say that at least two out of my five very best papers that I'm most proud of uh, were published uh, in JNNP. The work with Bill Gibb um, uh, relating to the Lewy body and its significance to the pathogenesis of Parkinson's disease. And then in the year 2000 with Gavin Giovannoni, our uh, description of um, dopamine dysregulation in a small number of patients uh, with, um, treated with levodopa and having Parkinson's disease. So of course, um, it's not surprising that uh, the archives committee uh, at Queen Square had no hesitation in agreeing to putting on uh, a display to uh, go with the online um, commemorations of the journal. And this is now live uh, in the medical library, which many of you will remember uh, at Queen Square. Um, it can be reviewed um, online, uh, and I've given the link below, and uh, Matthew may give other links through other JNNP sources. And for those of you who work at UCL or UCLH, um, you can visit it live um, up until the beginning of next year. Thank you very much.